Okay, good. So I, I noticed that I really have the limited number of time, so I really have to go fast. That uh, thank you very much for inviting me to give the lecture here. So the talk that uh, I'm giving today is probably very different from uh, many other speakers. So uh, many people like uh, talks about uh, using like uh, numerical methods or different kinds of numerical methods to solve some problems in high energy physics. That was so, of course interesting, but sometimes this kind of study could in inspire a, um, a kind of study for along another direction. So which is the, that uh, using high energy physics to solve like uh, algorithms about uh, classical or quantum running a classical or quantum computer. So about uh, quantum computing or machine learning and probably you could use some insights from physics or from high energy physics, quantum field theory uh, to uh, understand better what is going on in those algorithms. So my talk is, um, in that sense, my talk is a little bit different comparing to other people that it goes another way. So uh, so the title of my talk is called Neurotonic Kernel Theory from High Energy Physics. So uh, so uh, I will explain what it means, this word, Neurotonic Kernel Theory here. Uh, but uh, uh, I was supported by those institutes and, and then it is partially based on the work together with the people from IBM and also University of Chicago. So uh, yeah, thank you very much. So maybe we can start and then uh, yeah, later I will leave the time for questions. So this is me that maybe I can briefly ex uh, introduce myself. So my name is Jun Yu Liu. So I have a physics background. Uh, so uh, I used to be a Caltech grad student and graduated in the last year and right now I'm a joint postdoc scholar uh, between University of Chicago and IBM. So uh, yeah, so here is the outline of the talk today. So uh, it was a very brief introduction and uh, about part of it is the from the textbook of some other people. And then part of it is from my original paper. So my original my original work was uh, listed here, but and and then the uh, I already attached it in the introduction of my talk about the book I'm using for some general introductions of uh, machine learning and also neurotechnic kernel theory. So uh, this is outline where firstly I will introduce briefly about the classical understanding of uh, neurotechnic kernel theory and so-called large width limit, which already has uh, physics related interpretation. And later, and then actually, uh, after I'm, I'm, when I'm studying the theory by myself, I find, and then sometimes it's better to understand it in the way of physics and in the way of quantum computation. So later, I will briefly uh, explain the theory, <laughs> actually explain in the classical context through the theory of quantum computation and the especially variational quantum circuits. And later I will discuss and then how you can understand it and then what is the corresponding property in terms of quantum computation for understanding the neurotechnic kernel. So, and the aim of this uh, study is to understand the internal property or intrinsic property of machine learning and the first principle of machine learning. And the goal is to make predictions of the gradient descent algorithm widely used in optimization and machine learning and solve the gradient descent equation and then to understand and from the first principle why uh, deep learning is effectively useful in many cases. That is the eventual goal. So, but uh, there are um, so many people has the understanding that uh, probably machine learning has almost a long theory and the people just keep trying and uh, and of, in fact, this is not true. So deep learning has many theories and the people are working very hard on developing them and the, trying to explain what the pe people obs observe in practice. Although it's just look like an optimization problem and but there are lots of uh, ingredients that sometimes probably needs uh, people trained from other Field, uh, for instance, like physics, to um, I mean to push the field further uh, sometimes, and then sometimes we find that physics related or statistical mechanical or quantum field theory related knowledge is useful in that field. So that is the overall and uh, brief overview of the um, of, about the subject. So firstly, 
uh, I will briefly talk about uh, the theory of uh, neural and all, and also the large width limit. Uh, so um, I start from the basic introduction of the neural networks. So uh, some of you might know, or if you are not very familiar with this, and maybe you can read some textbook, that the first thing you have learned in the machine learning course in the textbook is about MLPs, which is called the multiple layer preceptor. So what it means is that it has some input and then in, in the middle, it has some like the hidden layers, which are output. And then you use it as a universal like a function uh, uh, fitting method that could fit an arbitrary function. So that is basically what it is in all machine learning related algorithms. So here I will define some terminologies in this picture about uh, this kind of, uh, um, and uh, is this kind of operations. So I will define the depths to be number of layers appears in this picture. And the uh, layer means that, uh, means that uh, you have here, you have input and the hidden layer and output. So the number of layer is three. And then uh, I will define also the width to be number of neurons in each layer. For instance, in the first, uh, like, a, uh, so we have three layers. In the first layer, we have width five and second, we have width three. And then the last one we have width two. Okay, so that is just a simple definition of the model and the terminology. And then recently people just realized that there is an analogy and between understanding the, uh, the correlation functions and also the gradient descent dynamics of the, um, uh, of the neural networks and uh, comparing to quantum field theories. So a clarification, a clarification is that this kind of correspondence is not physical, I mean, it's it's not real. So it is just a mathematical analogy. And then it's a completely different subject. Uh, however, we find that sometimes the intuition from physics is useful, uh, but we are not expecting all those physics related experiences are related. But people just find that there are some mathematical equivalence between the description of a um, of a neural network and description of a more precisely statistical field theory because there is no uh, really not really quantum inside it. So when I take the limit where the the width and to be large, so then um, and then and that theory of neural network becomes very similar to the large n limit of the gauge theory. And then the ratio between the depths, the depths and the width is something very similar to the tooth coupling. And when you consider uh, a larger gauge theory and the ADSFT correspondence. So in this description, deep neural network. So the word deep, and then that means that uh, your, your depth is sufficiently large. And then if you consider the depth divided by width ratio, so that corresponds to a large amount of coupling constant. And then that corresponds to the strongly coupled theory. And then on the other hand, the so-called wide neural network corresponds to a weakly coupled theory. So, and then we could use some of our training from quantum field theory to answer some important questions about machine learning using this kind of correspondence. So let me a little bit briefly explain what that means for this correspondence and which is given by this, uh, uh, by this page. And the, there are theorems that people prove that uh, for given MLPs and just now in the model and in the large width limit. So the neural tangent kernel is approximately a constant during gradient descent. And then I will explain what it means in the next slide, what it means for the neural tangent kernel. And then the correlation function of the neural outputs are approximately Gaussian. So the perturbative corrections are given by the ratio, which is given by the depth or width, uh, divided by width. That is what I mean by uh, so the, the correspondence. So the correspondence can be concerned about the correlation function. And the correlation function is defined as the following. So we well, when we have a neural network, we will specify the weights and bias, which are hyperparameters of the neural network. And then we define the correlation function to be averaging over weights and bias when we are initializing neural network. So there, it might be many different like uh, um, just realizations, but we are initialize them using like a Gaussian distribution and an independent Gaussian distribution. And then if we use that assumption, there are some weak contraction rule of those weights and bias. And then later people prove that 
And then you can compute the same correlation function, just like what we are computing in the uh, quantum field theory or statistical field theory. And then we could do it order by order using perturbative corrections. And then this theory uh, only holds also when the learning rate in the gradient descent is small enough. So uh, let me briefly explain what it means by neural tangent kernel. So um, we know that uh, usually people use uh, a gradient descent uh, method to compute the optimization process during machine learning. So starting from this, we will consider the mean square loss, which is a loss function. And then that's given by the square of uh, y minus z, where y is, uh, is the data label. And then in the supervised learning, for instance, a picture of a cat or dogs, and that is the pairing of uh, the picture vector and the corresponding answer, which is say dogs or cats. And then on the other hand, z is this notation here, that means the neural output. And then we have a hyperparameter theta, and then our input parameter is x alpha, where x alpha is the, the, the some, for, for instance, the vector of uh, 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 vectors corresponding to pictures. And then y is uh, uh, z is a prediction, and y is the answer we already know in the training set for the answer of cats and dogs. So that is the mean square loss, which is uh, widely used uh, in machine learning and statistics. And then we define the difference between the neural network output and the data label z minus y to be the so-called receder training error epsilon. So we are borrowing the language from uh, linear algebra and linear regression. So epsilon is given by z minus y, which is so-called receder training error. So, and then if you consider the difference and then between two time steps in the gradient descent and uh, in different iterations, so that is given by this gradient descent equation. That is the definition of the algorithm. So this fancy D here on theta and corresponding to the difference between two time steps, it's like the discrete version of the derived. And the theta is a hyperparameter you are used to train in the neural network. So, and then that is equal to minus eta times the L divided by the theta. Uh, that is the definition of the gradient descent algorithm. So eta is a small number, which is called the learning rate. And then, so the point of neural tangent kernel theory is that instead of considering the change of rational uh, variables and hyperparameters theta in the gradient descent, we can plug it back and taking a further derivative towards the prediction of z, and uh, which is basically uh, linearly related to the residual training error. So the residual training error, and then just because of the linear algebra and then basic analysis, it's given by the I mean, at the first order approximation, that's gonna be given by the uh, by some linearly uh, linear combination of the change between two time steps of the variational angle or theta, basically the hyperparameters times their Taylor coefficient at the first order, and then you go a step further, you get this kind of formula, and then so that is given by a thing where we call the neural tangent kernel K with the indices like the label inside the data set and uh, together with uh, and a product with a vector, which is a residual training error. So that is the time evolution of the, um, of the uh, output of the gradient descent, uh, so of the neural network and or the residual training error is basically given by this formula. So, and we could immediately realize that if this quantity is a constant for this K, if this K is a constant, during gradient descent. So this equation immediately has a exponentially decaying solution. The reason is because, I mean, we could recall that if you understand this as a differential equation, uh, if it is partial of Z is given by minus eta times itself and times the constant, and then the answer is e to the minus eta times that constant times the time. And because it is basically a first order differential equation with diffusive dynamics that we are familiar with uh, in, the, I mean, in, the, in the study of uh, Newtonian mechanics or, uh, or the ODEs. And then, so that's, that means that the gradient descent dynamics and then in the limit where the neural tangent kernel goes to a constant is exactly solvable. And uh, that corresponds to, in some sense, that corresponds to the um, um, the solvable theory 
of uh, machine learning and closely related to the Gaussian correlation functions that I was mentioning in this theorem. And then you could use uh, quantum field theory techniques to make predictions of the Gaussian correlation functions, not Gaussianity, and using perturbation theory and also the gradient descent dynamics uh, using the neural training curve. So uh, this sounds a little abstract, but uh, unfortunately I have to jump to a, a little bit different topic. But uh, but then if you are still confusion, have confusions about those basic concepts, I could I recommend you to read this book and uh, by Robert Sierra and Hannon. They are especially the first two authors, Dan Roberts and Shio Yada, who used to be high energy physicists, which is similar to me. And then, uh, and then later they moved to machine learning related subject. And then right now they become important uh, um, leader of uh, machine learning theory area. And then you can you can take a look on their book recently. The so called principle of deep learning theory for further like a. Uh, um, for further reading and some explaining some basic concepts about the neurotechnic parallel theory in that book. So, uh, and so I find that uh, in order to understand that better, so sometimes it's better to go to quantum computing and actually our work and uh, containing our original paper also provides a generalization of uh, neurotechnic parallel series from classical machine learning to quantum machine learning. So, uh, let me briefly explain what it means. So what is quantum machine learning and in like a, a very brief words and the quantum machine learning by definition that is doing machine learning or gradient descent dynamics in a quantum computer. So currently what people have and why do you use in that area is to call variational quantum algorithms or variational quantum circuits. And basically if you have a unitary operator you want to program but let's say in a quantum computing and then you could parameterize it by a bunch of variational angle theta. So for instance, here we have a number of uh, like rotation related gates with some constant gates. And then we can write the unitary operator we are programming in this way, and which is given by a product of a bunch of constant gates, for instance, like CNOT gates, and together with e to the i theta x, uh, which is like, uh, which is uh, where x are some poly, for instance, permission operators or general permission operators that is relatively easy to access and uh, in the uh, existing quantum devices. And then this kind of unitary operator is programmable in the classical variable theta. And then you can do the gradient descent and machine learning for those variable theta to make predictions, like finding the ground state of some quantum system approximately. So that is why they use the called the variational quantum eigensolver and in uh, quantum chemistry that is claimed to be maybe have some potential to be have some advantage against the classical computation. And then that is also called nice co quantum computational chemistry. And this architecture here itself is called the quantum neural networks. So similarly, we can define a neurotechnic kernel series here. So we start from the variational assets or variational quantum algorithms we define here. And then we have those kind of uh, constant gate W and the programming uh, variational angle theta. And then we act on some state we know, let's say zero state and in the quantum computer. And then we could define loss function, which is given by quantum measurement, but measure some operators uh, of those quantum states. And then we consider the difference between that expectation value and also this uh, uh, a number, which is given by O0. So that could be used to be, for instance, like finding the ground state where O is a Hamiltonian of some system and O zero is their corresponding ground state. And then we increase ground state energy and we want to find the minimal energy of uh, minimal ground state of that, uh, of the ground state of that Hamiltonian. Or you can just simply set O zero to zero. And if you just want to minimize this Hamiltonian and you don't know what is corresponding minimal eigenvalue is. And this is, this becomes a toy example of the example I just showed before, where you have this kind of supervised learning, and then that is in fact a one plus one, one times one dimensional supervised learning kind of tasks. And then you could also define the uh, residual training error here, but instead of a vector that I show you just now, which is a little confusion, here it is just a, a constant. I mean a number, a scalar. Sorry, not a constant, but a scalar. And then you could also define the gradient descent algorithm like this. And then just now, as I explained before, instead of uh, considering the, the moving of uh, variational angles, 
beta or hyperparameters in each step, we can directly consider the uh, uh, residual training errors. And then that is given by, as a first order, the Taylor expansion in the limit where learning rate is sufficiently small. And then if you plug this uh, direct, uh, quadratic relation, which is basically the mean square loss, inside the Taylor expansion, you get this expression where you can define this quantity K, which we call quantum inner training kernel. And then you will realize that if this guy is a constant, just as I explained before, if this guy is a constant, this uh, kind of difference equation becomes D epsilon equals to a constant times epsilon itself. And then the answer is a exponential decay solution. Uh, but uh, it's, it's not E to the minus E that kt unless we take either to be infinitely small then this difference equation becomes odes uh, but uh, in general we can solve the uh, difference equation directly and then we get this exponentially decaying phenomenon so we we in the limit where k is a constant we get the exact prediction so the reason that we could get that instead of uh, say often it is not predictable is because if k is when k is almost a constant, then this gradient is in progress uh, be becomes approximately linearized. We almost get a linear regression. So we know that the error of the linear regression is exponentially decaying during you are doing training, say in the example of linear regression of support of vector machine. So that's kind of why that we can get the exact prediction. Okay, and then, but in general, this quantity k is a number that depending highly on the hyperparameters. So when K is highly fluctuating, and we're here, we uh, give some expression of K in terms of those variational quantum circuits, and you can just compute them simply by taking a first derivative, and then you get those commutators. And that was highly fluctuating during uh, in the variational angles and during the gradient descent dynamics. So that is, the terminology, uh, usually machine learning people call this, is so called representation learning. So that means that we are learning the representation of the data during gradient descent because we are not in the linearized region. So how the theory could be useful because we know that the linearized region, it is constant, but, uh, but then uh, it's linearized. So it sounds simple enough. And then how do we get non-trivial predictions? And of course, I'm non-trivial here. So then that is, uh, that is a power of, uh, of the neurotechnic kernel theory, just like I mentioned as a perturbation theory. So you could study them as perturbations around a fixed point where this is given by the, I mean, free theory limit or were given by the neurotechnic kernel large with them. So firstly, one could look at the laser training kind of example where the variational angle is, was almost a constant plus some corrections. When a rational angle is almost a constant, of course, this near tangent kernel K is also almost a constant. And then you could just exactly solve the gradient descent dynamics. And then you could also do perturbation series. And then the first order, just now I solved the ODEs directly for you. So that was an exponential decaying function. But in the first order perturbation series in the learning rate eta, you can go to further steps. And the answer is that uh, uh, it's going to be a uh, linear uh, function, a polynomial uh, times this exponential decay. So it's a little slower decaying comparing to direct exponential decay, but it's still decaying and vanishing to zero at a long time. So this first order perturbation series is an important result. It will actually reveal many features in the representation learning. But uh, what I'm showing in the slides in motivation is that we can compute this kind of corrections order by order. So because we use Taylor expansions here and assuming that learning rate is small and we could go to higher orders and predicting this quantity like order by order, uh, we can do perturbation theory. And what we have is just almost like Feynman diagram related calculations. And then we can just like do, do it just uh, like what we did in quantum field theory. So you can update, update this to a general machine learning, supervised learning problem. In a quantum setup, it's going to be uh, more like a, it, it's related to um, uh, multiple uh, operators I'm training and also the multiple data sets I'm using where I embed the data sets to the, uh, to the, uh, to the hyperspace. And where for classical data X delta or quantum data, 
and then we could embed it to a Kilbert space. Note that this step is doable uh, in quantum computing, at least in theory, and using so-called quantum random access memory, but I probably do not have time to explain what it means, but you could look at our paper. So, and then you could do the same thing, and then you could try to make the prediction of this so-called, uh, this uh, gradient descent dynamics, and then notice that right now the neurotangent kernel theory uh, is, um, is in the neurotangent kernel itself, it's a matrix instead of a number. So notice that it is a matrix in the um, in the in the uh, in the space of events in the space of data. So that's why it's called a kernel. And you can prove that it was always positive, definite, and symmetry. And just like, uh, for instance, in this super reduced case where we have a number, you 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 know that it's gonna be has to be positive definite because epsilon is real. So, uh, but I mean in general, uh, so this thing could be like a, a matrix, and then it has to be symmetric, and uh, and then defined in this way, and also you can prove that it's positive symmetric definite. So, and then similar to the study before, and we have this uh, frozen neuron quantum neuron kernel in the limit where the neuron kernel get to a constant in a perturbation theory. And then we have exponential convergence. And then you can also do the uh, first order perturbation theory and we can define so-called quantum meta kernel. So the classical analog is dis discussed in this book, but here we generalize it to quantum. It was almost the same, but you could uh, say that those expressions are complicated, but uh, they are just uh, philosophically or empirically, it's gonna be the same as what we did here. And then, so here importantly, so the nonlinearity of the theory comes from the two uh, sources. The first thing is that neurotonic kernel itself might change. So the kernel itself will, will change in the next leading order. And secondly, you have to go to the higher order when you are doing the gradient descent. Note that here, we only keep the first order uh, of the Taylor expansion of the residual training error, but you have to do it better. And in the next leading order case where you have to consider the so-called meta kernel, which is classifying the change of the neurotrain kernel during the gradient descent dynamics. So people use words to describe this kind of theory, so-called algorithm projector and appearing in this kind of prediction and also algorithm dependence. And uh, this is a feature of representation learning. And then I recommend you to read our paper and also this book uh, for further reference. And then actually we find that this is a very good way that uh, not only we could study machine learning, but also we could study rational quantum circuits and quantum computation. Here are some computation of neurotangent kernel eigenvalues in the noisy and noiseless uh, setup uh, where we can do the simulation and compute the neurotangent kernel there from quantum computation. And at the late time, we know that, notice this frozen regime where neurotangent kernel eigenvalues becomes almost a constant. So I think uh, we, ha we have limited amount of time. So finally, I will briefly explain uh, so how it's a, a, a further theory going a further ahead of it to say how it will uh, have a very similar prediction and similar to the theory that I showed before where the Gaussian correlation functions when we are averaging over something. And just now I'm saying that the correlation function is defined by averaging over weights and bias in classical machine learning. But for here, for quantum, it is different. The setup is that uh, you can averaging over rational assets or rational quantum circuits. And then in the in the, in the just now uh, showing in the uh, just uh, show, showing the previous expression of the neurotangent kernel and also the neural output correlation functions. So that technique is uh, widely used in classical machine learning people and also quantum people for like a cryptography and also for a study of quantum chaos and even black holes using so called hidden Prisco experiment. So the idea is that. Uh, you could represent approximately random sample, uniform sample from a unitary group. And that is called so called the hard measure. And then we use the parameter K to uh, correspond to the case order moments that has the same predictions of the exact hard measure, and which is a uniform measure in a unitary group. So here we are adapting that technology. And then we are integrating over all possible uh, so, rational circuits 
that uh, appearing and all possibly appearing in the unitary group up to some approximations that is achievable by the quantum hardware. So, and then after we averaging over this, we get rid of the dependence on the version of this. And we find this is called the K design assumption. And what we find that the gradient descent, um, the gradient descent uh, dynamics, and then or the near tangent kernel is predictable and by those beautiful formula, if you are averaging over it using like a K design assumptions. And then uh, this, the so-called over parameterization phenomena or the so-called fixed, almost the fixed value of the neural tangent kernel comes to the fact that if you're averaging over them using, uh, using uh, K design assumptions, and then you will get that uh, the variance of the neural tangent kernel divided by itself, the standard deviation divided by itself is suppressed by the large width. L here is the number of hyperparameters. If L is large, sufficiently large, and the delta K is ignorable and as a standard deviation. And that's why like in the over parameterization regime, if you take an arbitrary neural network, quantum neural network is just frozen. So this is a ser uh, classical uh, quantum counterpart of the theorem I'm stating before, where if you're near, uh, in a large width limit in a quantum theory, and also you will have a, um, a almost a fixed, um, neural tangent kernel, and then you get uh, predictions around the perturbation theory. So, and then this calculation is pretty not trivial. So I also recommend you to, to take a look on our paper. Uh, but uh, so roughly speaking, one word, if uh, in a classical uh, computation- Can you try to sorry, wrap it up? We're, we're trying- Yeah, sure, very soon, okay. very soon. In okay. classical computation and um, machine learning, classical machine learning is more close to a statistical or a quantum field theory. Uh, but in quantum machine learning, the theory is more like a matrix model, like the BFS's matrix model. So where we are integrating directly over matrices and then instead of integrating over weights and bias. So, and then this integral and it could be understood as a path integral when we are sampling over like the different hyperparameters of the neural network. So I have to write that up, up uh, pretty fast, and then we. Uh, the further, furthermore, the slides is about the numerical evidence that about those relations. And then, thank you very much for your attendance. And then, I'm very happy. I mean, to be here, and also feel free to ask me any questions. Okay, thank you, Junju. Yes. We have time for one or two questions. Anyone? Yeah. John, can you use the microphone? Uh, I'm sorry. Hi, uh, this is Masanori. Hi. Hi. So you, Hi. you uh, basically you, uh, uh, especially in the case of classical, you consider the weak coupling, why the with this limit, which is weak coupling and uh, all the calculation models look like uh, weak coupling. But I wonder if you use this, uh, how randomness, maybe you can also go to a strong coupling, which is, which would mean uh, with this is not too wide. Uh, I, I, I don't know, practically, yeah. practically that the wide with this limit is useful for practical application or long, deep, deep uh, network limit or small with this limit is more useful. Uh, I wasn't yeah. sure. And yeah. if a strong coupling can be studied, maybe you can find some duality or something, I, I just. <laughs> Yeah, so so yeah, it's a very good question. So uh, firstly, there is no definition of depths in this quantum setup uh, because right now the quantum in quantum neural network is more like a classical neural network with a singly with one layer. So oh, sorry, uh, with one layer. So the depth is always one. So then in that case, uh, so that's why it's suppressed by one over square root L instead of like a de depth divided by the width. So, but uh, this uh, requires the theory that uh, the neural tangent kernel is almost fixed, requires a large number of trainable parameters. So that's gonna be, has to be really large in order to make this value to be fixed that corresponds to a large land image. And then making it to be like a less practically useful because we don't have that many trainable parameters. So however, it is just like the infinite width limit in the classical machine learning. It's more like a toy model that we could study just like a free quantum field theory. Uh, but 
uh, on the other hand, so it's a very good question like to ask if this kind of theory is practically useful in a, in a case where you have a fixed uh, finance width. And uh, the, the reason is that it is, and then at least empirically, there is one application. So because we know that uh, in general, like a neurotangent kernel it is a function of a hyperparameters, you can sample over your possible hyperparameters and then you will find that at some hyperparameters, neurotangent kernel is a larger number. Some parameter is gonna be a smaller number. This histogram is uh, x axis is a probability distribution function. Y axis is the value of the neurotangent kernel. And then you could will find that, uh, and then there were some values that are neurotangent kernel are higher and some values are lower. And then when you are initializing your neural network, you can say that, okay, higher value of the quantum neurotangent kernel or classical neurotangent kernel is preferred because that will lead to faster decay rate during during the gradient descent. And then practically you could choose that quantity and then and then that will have a better preference. So that is a guidance from how the theory is useful in the practical application of uh, circuit design in classical quantum machine learning. So that is an example of how it is useful. But for the exact solvable dynamics, and you're right that currently uh, it's it's challenging to solve it in final width and maybe you can solve it in some way and maybe some duality could be conjectured or fine, but those are something, currently those theories are just like a baby theory in the early stage and uh, people are still developing it. In fact, it was a hot, very hot topic of a classical machine learning uh, in that community like uh, two or three years ago where many people write their corresponding series and using those techniques to give proofs about their practical neural networks. But, uh, and then uh, I would say that it's still in development and people are trying to, um, hard to understand the theory. And maybe some dualities were something more similar to uh, some, strongly coupled version of say ADS CFT could be discovered in this context. And uh, yeah, so that's the answer to the question. Uh, we're, we're gonna go to the next uh, speaker because we're running late on the, on the session. <laughs>